collective memories of major nationally important events like Pearl Harbor um, or the Vietnam War, um, which have been memorialized. Um, the Pearl Harbor, the uh, Arizona Memorial is so important, it gets almost two million visitors a year. And uh, these kind of stories take on more and more importance sometimes in a culture over time because of what they mean symbolically to people in the culture. And I think over a long period of time, they take on mythic status. They're, not, they're no longer simple history. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the expansion uh, by the, uh, the early settlers as they went west. Um, and they felt they had some kind of God-given right to drive out the Native Americans who were living there. And that gave rise to the notion of manifest d uh, destiny. Um, those kind of events are part of the mythic history of the culture. Or the Thanksgiving story is a very important story, which is often not told very accurately in school. Um, the unpleasant aspects of that story about the massacre of some of the Native Americans is not taught to school children. So in those kind of ways, the, 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 the history becomes mythicized the memories are not accurate anymore. They don't just reproduce what happened. It never was, but always is. Meaning that the, the stories of myth are not literally true, um, but they, they say something that's, that's psychologically and spiritually important. So for example, um, the myth of Sisyphus ro rolling his boulder up a hill only to have it roll down again. Um, is obviously not literally true, but we've all felt like Sisyphus, Sisyphus in the sense that we have um, the sense that we're doing a task over and over again and it keeps needing to be redone over and over again. Uh, um, that's that's the, the truth of the story is in there, even though it's not literal history. In, in the mythology of North Korea, there's a notion that the Kim family is descended from some ancient semi-divine figure from several thousand years ago. And so that that family is regarded, uh, the, or the, really the people have been brainwashed into thinking that this is, that this is a kind of semi-divine lineage. So that when um, uh, somebody, who, uh, an American politician says something offensive about the Korean leader, this is like uh, not just les majesté, not just offending the, the king, but doing something sacrilegious. Um, and so he is regarded as a kind of semi-sacred figure. Now, from our point of view, he's just a, a, a you know, rather toxic politician. But from their point, if you understand their mythology, uh, you, you understand why this is so important to them. Well, I think everyone probably has a numinous dream at some point in their life. Um, the difficulty is that people don't recognize it for what it is. If you have a dream of a traditional religious figure like Jesus Christ or the Blessed Virgin Mary, then you know immediately that you've had a dream of that figure. But if you were raised in, say, in a, um, a traditional Christian household and you have a dream of a Hindu god or goddess, you may not recognize what it is that you've dreamt. And you won't see it as, a manif as an authentic manifestation of the sacred or the holy because it isn't how you've been taught to experience the sacred or the holy, so it might be dismissed. Sometimes you might go to a clergyman with a, a, a dream like that, and you might be told it was demonic, for example. Whereas, in fact, it's a manifestation of the transpersonal level of the psyche, of the, of the autonomous psyche, which can't be Christianized. It manifests itself any way that it wants to. Yes, you try to show what the symbolic meaning of that particular, say it's a, a god or goddess from another pantheon, not the one they grew up in. You look at the, in that particular pantheon, you look at the quality of that god or goddess, and that's what is coming to the fore in the dream, and that might be a very important quality for the dreamer to acknowledge in him or herself.